Daisy Love. That song, when we're on our knees, can make us rise. Thank you. Good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. And I know that when our time comes to a close this morning, you're going to feel that 10 times greater than what you're feeling right now. That whatever caused you to draw breath this morning and to roll over twice and to rise up and to be here will have been worth every effort, every bit of energy that you applied to it. Will you join me in a prayer as we start our message together? One that's been modified, one that you know, but you'll hear the modification. Just draw that breath in this morning. We're all grateful that we share that in common, the ability to draw in the energy that flows through us. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Spirit, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in surrendering that we are born into recovery. Together we can all say amen in that energy. So this morning in preparing, you know, several months ago, we talked about the opportunity to focus on recovery in this service. You know, we all gather together to be in the space and presence of each other. Sometimes we're reminded of the glory of life through song, like we just were. No matter where you were, no matter what was going on, and no matter how much you resisted, I watched you. Give in to Daisy's song, to be able to absorb the music, to be able to move into a space of hopefulness and opportunity as opposed to whatever you came in with. I'm preparing to share with you this morning, I was looking for inspiration. You know, in 12 step recovery programs, they talk about the power of the I am statement. I am an alcoholic. I am an addict. So, my wife gave me the inspiration. So, she and my niece headed off to the tattoo shop. And there's my wife's arm. This week, I am. I couldn't believe it. I was like, she has been working at this tattoo for uh, maybe decades. And my niece kept prodding and poking and texting. And then I am showed up on her wrist this week. That is why we gather together to be reminded of the I am statement, right? Now, we don't all have to go to the tattoo shop. That's not going to be the action at the end of the... All of you, go get your I am. No. But we do have to constantly be reminded of that truth because the human condition is one that causes us to fall asleep and to forget that. Gathering like we are here right now is that reminder. It is that recentering in that gathering that says, yes, I remember. There's a scripture I want to share with you. It speaks about Jesus going to the porticos, the five stations that were in Bethesda. It's a powerful scripture. Soon after another feast came around and Jesus was back in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda with five alcoves. Now, five alcoves 
The thing that is beautiful about unity in our belief is that we believe that the Bible and all spiritual writings are relevant today. And I would suggest to you, when you finish these verses, it can't be lost on you that the literal interpretation wasn't the goal, but that the story was so that it would become timeless and applicable to all of us today. Hundreds of sick sick people, blind, crippled, and paralyzed, were in these alcoves. The five alcoves are our five senses. Have you ever been paralyzed, unable to see, unable to hear? Have you been in a spot in your life that no matter what, you were not aware of the presence of where you were? Have you been there? One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. 38 years. Come on, are you kidding me? We're going to pick out of all of the numbers 38 years. Why? Because 40 is the number that is used throughout the Bible to demonstrate enough time has passed and we are ready to move forward. The flood, 40 days and 40 nights. How long was Jesus out praying? 40 So this man was there for 38 years. What does that mean? Just almost ready. 38 years. When Jesus saw him and he was stretched out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, now pay attention to that. This is five alcoves littered with humanity. There aren't five people in each alcove, one in each alcove. Jesus stepped over, walked past, moved beyond many, and went to the one who was ready. 38 years, ready, when he knew how long he had been there. Do you think the story is about a man who had been there 38 years? Or do you think you are receiving a message today that says, Spirit will show up for you when you're ready. This comes alive today. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? Now watch the response and think of those people in your world. And maybe you too. I know I've said these things. The sick man said, sir, When the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get there, somebody else is already in, in my space. Have you been there? Have you had your story? There's nothing I can do. I've tried, Jesus. I've prayed. I'm always last. It doesn't happen. Somebody else gets the job. Somebody else gets the spouse, the partner. Somebody else wins the lotto. Nothing happens for me. In our illness, in our sickness, in our story. Jesus doesn't pay any attention to it. What does he say? He says, get up, take your bedroll, and start walking. The man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and walked off. The rest of the story gets interesting. Because everybody in his world said, you can't do that. Today's the Sabbath. Have you ever gotten up and started to make the change and everybody in your circle says, oh, no, no. You can't do that. I know you for who you are. Change is not in your possession or in your power. Have you been there? For those of us, I'm going to ask this question. Raise your hand. How many, if it's you or in your family, have been touched by addiction. <clears throat> I want you to look around this room. You are surrounded by those who have been. This is a spiritual journey. We are all reflections of each other on this journey together. We have a tendency to want to separate and divide and judge. We do it to ourselves. We do it to others, but those who are walking the path of recovery are walking right next to us and with us. And that's a hard journey for all of us. 
<clears throat> we know that the path of addiction has a lot of heartbreak with it. For those who don't wake up and remember who they are, for those of us who we were talking this morning, who have showed up and worked so hard to do all we could before they were 38 years old. They weren't ready. Jesus didn't go to the ones who were 32, 25, 19. He went to the one who was 38, almost ready. In the big book, there is something that speaks powerfully to the experience of recovery. It tells us that this spiritual journey is an invitation. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Unless one's family expresses a desire to live upon spiritual principles, we think we ought not to urge them. We should not talk incessantly to them about spiritual matters because they're not 38. They will change in time. Our behavior will convince them more than our words. We must remember that 10 or 20 years of drunkenness would make a skeptic out of anyone. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom, a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will compre comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize for all who work them. In AA, that page, 83, provides a roadmap and a hope that has been traveled by so many. This morning, we are celebrating Michael Brock. And his journey in recovery. So we're going to have a little discussion, a little sharing. And if you were moved by the music at the beginning, when Michael shares with us as we close our time together, I can promise you, you'll never forget what is about to be shared. Reverend Glenn, will you join us too? Michael Buck, let's give it up. One, two, one, two, three, four. I just wanted to sing this little song for you because I feel so good. How many of you feel good this morning? Just a little bit. See, see. One, two, three, four. This little light of mine. Come on, y'all. I'm going to let it shine. If you don't mind. This little light of mine. Hey, I'm going to let it shine. Woo! This little light of mine. I said, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I got to say this, y'all. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Ah, Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. I said, Everywhere I go. This little light of mine Come on I'm gonna let it shine Oh, oh, oh This little, this little light, light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Woo! Oh, 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 oh This little light, light of mine Good God Almighty I'm, I'm gonna, gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Sorry about that 
about that bread I had to do. Yes, Lord. Woo! So when we were preparing for service and rehearsed, Michael pulled me aside over the wall. He said, you ever tried to control an artist? I said, nope. I just get out of the way. And it's always good when we do. So thank you for being thank here this you. morning. Thank you. This week was the a big week for you. Yes. And yes. it began a day at a time. One day at a time. So share with everybody why we're here today. One day at a time. 34 years clean and sober. Then God good. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to be here with you this morning and uh you're not alone if you're dealing with someone with addiction or alcoholism or if you are experiencing it yourselves. Uh, I'm a living witness that you can recover one day at a time. God is good. All right. Now, 34 years ago, this past September 14th, Started with a single day 34 years ago, but my hunch is, as we talked earlier, that that wasn't the first time <laughs> that you had started down that journey. No, no. What was your well, point thank moving you, forward? Well, thank you, Fred. My experience was um, I started using at the age of 11, smoking weed and drinking and um, I had an addictive personality. I fell in love with alcohol. Alcohol did not love me. I'm addicted to alcohol. When I start drinking, uh, I end up in handcuffs. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but uh, 34 years ago, I entered uh, into a treatment center, the Salvation Army of Harbor Light. But prior to that, from the age of 11 to 22, I drank and smoked, did drugs and alcohol every day of my life. And uh, come from a dysfunctional home where my dad was an alcoholic. And uh, my mom died when I was 11 years old. So uh, that mother mother's wit and motherly love I didn't have. And I mourned through alcohol, drugs. Uh, my, my, my addiction flared up so bad, I, I lost a scholarship at Western Michigan University, uh, smoking crack cocaine, uh, drinking on a regular basis. And I tell you, it, 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 it led me to uh, a, a very hard life at a young age. And um, that's why sometimes today, Brett, I, I, I laugh and I joke a lot, for those who may not know, or whatever, because I didn't experience a childhood very much. Or uh, I, I learned to grow up. Uh, in uh, uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I want to take this time to thank uh, my sponsor, who's sitting over to my left. Uh, his name is Steve Sealander. If you would hey. give him a hand, because he has a rough job with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I love him so much. Uh, uh, he he always has a word of wisdom for me, and uh, he was speaking to me about acceptance this morning. And acceptance is the answer to all of my problems, being able to accept um, that um, I'm not perfect. Uh, I still struggle. I'm, I, wanted, I wanted a drink so bad the other day, I, I, I didn't know what hit me. And I, 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 I sing at a lot of uh, events where there's alcohol everywhere all the time. And uh, these days, you smell marijuana <laughs> everywhere all the time. 
So I'm thinking, well, maybe I can probably take me a joint or a drink or something. <laughs> I mean, it's legal now, you know. <laughs> And, and, and then my other mind says, well, you've never been able to take one of anything. <laughs> you've always ended up in handcuffs or <laughs> in, a, in a bad state of mind. So uh, I want to thank you for your time and kindness this morning. I really appreciate everyone uh, here this morning, everyone here this morning, uh, uh, I also like to extend uh, my condolence to uh, Daisy, Daisy Love, uh, the director. Um, as you all know, she had some uh, a death with her daughter, and uh, she mentioned it to me this morning, and I, I was already prepared. I prayed and I asked God to guide, lead, and direct my my thoughts and my presentation, um, and uh, when she spoke with me, I was like a sponge, and, but it's never too late, never ever too late. Uh, so you all have an opportunity that you can speak with myself, Steve, or Daisy, because the experience, this is the best teacher. Michael and the program, what did you find? Where was, what is a moment that stood out to you in the program in AA? Thank where you. Where you oh. felt changed at depth, that there was something, it didn't mean it was done, of course, mm -hmm. but there was a change for you, a healing. It was a bottom for me. I, um, I had, uh, my first wife, uh, I had left, and uh, I was in a uh, crack house, and um, I had lost uh, everything, and I had no place to go, and I felt like I had no one to talk to, and uh, uh, I entered the Salvation Army of Harbolite, where, where, uh, God spoke with me or tapped me on the shoulder because being 22, 23 years old, um, the predictions are pretty bad. You know, and everybody's saying this guy ain't gonna stay clean. He's not gonna, you know, everything was against me. And uh, so uh, what, led me and inspired me to do the right thing as far as staying clean was attending meetings. It wasn't just one quick fix. It was um, getting a sponsor, attending meetings, reading the literature, praying, finding my spirituality, and making amends being honest, open, and willing. You were surrounded by people who loved you from your first breath. You lost your mom at 11. But you had people who were around you who cared about you, loved on you, who were worried for you, who were willing to do anything for you. When you look back at them and, and you reach into those memories, what could they have done? What needed to be done for you? What could have been done for you to help you find the path? There's a lot of folks here who have no, that problem. question, sure. you know? Sure, sure. Well, uh, it's actually nothing they can do because it's all up to me. Uh, uh, they can... Mm, they can uh, show me some type of love, being able to listen or whatever, but I, I had to uh, play, play a big role in changing and uh, like you said, uh, uh, the, the 38 years or 
uh, being in that mindset and being able to uh, wanting change. And for me, my dad was so strict <laughs> uh, and so hard and tough on me. I didn't want to have to go to him and say, I need something. I mean, he he said, you know, he kicked me out of the house when I was 15. Um, a lot of people say, well, man, that was tough. No, I needed to be kicked out <laughs> because I wasn't listening. I wasn't, I was, you know, selling drugs and, you know, I, 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 I stealing, you know, all, all type of things. I did it all, you know. And, 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 and he said to me, I'll never forget. He said, well, you know what, son? I'm having company tonight. Could you find somewhere to go? I said, well, Daddy, I'm only 15. He said, you'll be 16 soon. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I mean, I share that. And, you know, but, uh, don't get me wrong. I, they, they, I, I did need some compassion. I did need uh, some, some, some love and understanding. And, but I wasn't, eh, I take it back. I, I, say, I always say I wasn't abused as a child. Yes, I was. Mm. You know, I, I got a lot of uh, painful whoopings and, you know, because back then, yeah, you got whoopers. They had paddling in the schools back then. You know what I mean? And I I got it all. You know. <laughs> Thank you. So Reverend Glenn, you've been around the world of addiction in your personal life and in your professional life and you've been in so many conversations with so many of us in this community. So when you hear our focus this morning on trying to create hope and understanding and the opportunity to not just sit, sit here and celebrate with Michael, but what comes up for you as you've walked this path and you think of those who are here with us this morning, what comes up for you? I think the elephant in the room is that we all have addictions. Come on. Wee. And so the question is, what's yours? And will you bring it out of that secret place, that dark space, and bring it to the light so it can be healed? Alcohol was in my family. Um, my dad um, is an alcoholic. Didn't know what that was until one day when I was probably about 10 years of age, my dad came in. I didn't know he was intoxicated, but he fell. And he was on the floor, and the only thing I knew as a child was you go pick up your father. And so I went to pick him up, and my mother yelled at me, and she said, don't pick him up. Don't. I learned that day that Alcohol would be in my family for a long time, and I avoided it. Uh, I went off to college and tried like heck to avoid it. I'm in a fraternity. I played football, and there was alcohol and drugs all around, steroids, and you know I tried not to um, as much as possible. Um, but then when I went back home, uh, I realized that my twin sister had an addiction to alcohol which I don't share very often because uh, I love her more than anybody else. And she passed away. But I realized over the course of time that I'm a big enabler. You know, I've been somewhat successful in life, spiritually, mentally, physically, and certainly financially. But because of that, I've been spaces where I've been able to enable people, you know, and do things. Go get me a fifth. You know, and if anybody know, don't know what the fifth is, that's usually whiskey or gin. <laughs> 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 or give me a six pack. And, and you just do it out of a spirit of love. You think it's love. 
But a lot of times, like you said, love is giving people space. It's giving them space to find the space for them to get in recovery. So it is really important as a spiritual community that we have these conversations because we can't often have them at our dining room table or on the text with somebody in your family. We can't do that because it's not safe often. And in this place, we have to have the conviction of our faith that all can find healing no matter the trauma. No matter the trauma. That you can walk into the doors here and be here and find the support and the love and the care that can get you through today, through this morning. No matter what your part of your journey you're going through. We have to believe that what we believe can carry us through. And what I love about what we believe is that it is timeless. That we do, it isn't a situation where we have to tell Michael that we're going to walk over and lay hands on him and that's how he's going to change. It doesn't work that way. It never has worked that way. If it had worked that way, the scripture we shared would have been written differently. Jesus walked in, touched all, fed all, healed all, and it was done. There isn't anybody in this space that is willing to limit Jesus' power, right? So he did what worked. And what worked was connecting in love with those who are ready. And you were ready 38, 34 years ago. You were ready at 11. That loss, that trauma, is where we can show up and heal each other early. Early. Not in a school district that's got a paddle hanging on the principal's door. That's not what you needed at 11. That isn't what's being healed now as this man who is providing his testimony in front of all of us. We have to change what we do Collectively and individually. The blessing that the two of you have shared this morning, and Steve, thank you for being willing to stand and to be of service to so many, to Michael, but to so many in our community. There are those of you who need to connect. There are some resources that are going to go up on the screen that are available. But the truth of it is those resources that are most powerful are the ones at the top because you know these people. Michael has made a commitment to be available if somebody calls. Steve has committed. Glenn has committed. Wilma has committed. Anybody in this community is committed to connect and to be there and to stand. Not solve. Remember the first part of that, page 83, right? We can't sit around and make everybody change. But to be present for each other, to open that hope up. Michael Brock. We love you, we appreciate you, and we believe in you. We have watched a transformation. I remember watching you on the stage at our place in Warren. And I said to you on the phone two weeks ago, the transformation at depth of who you are is evident to all who know you. And it is because you have done the work And nobody's sitting around, including Michael, going, well, I'm perfect. I got it all done. None of us are. But we must recognize the young boy who is being healed in this work. He just shared with you the little bit of it. The little bit of it. The little bit of it. So we're grateful for your walk the hope that you bring, the joy that you bring.